Well, a very good morning to you uh, this morning, and another week has passed. It's another Sunday morning, um, and by my reckoning, this is day uh, 34 of our lockdown period, and I hope and I pray uh, that you're all doing really well and that you're all staying safe. This morning, as I said last week, uh, I'm going to continue looking through Mark's Gospel together, as we've been doing uh, in the church for on and off the last two years uh, now, last week we looked at a request that uh, the two disciples, two brothers, James and John, had for Jesus as they were going towards Jerusalem. They took him to one side and said, look, Lord, can we have the top positions, the top jobs when you come into your kingdom? And we talked about Jesus's reaction to that last week. So this week I want us to look at the next few verses down in Mark chapter 10. That's Mark 10 verses 41 to 45. Mark 10, 41 says this, And when the ten heard it, they began to be greatly displeased with James and John. But Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great among you shall be you a servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slaves of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10 verses 41 to 45. And so the passage starts off that we are reading this morning. It starts off with the other ten disciples. They have got wind of the request of James and John. And they are not best pleased about what they have heard. And so an argument erupts between all of the, the, te the 12 disciples, the 10 on one side, James and John on the other. And the disciples are saying to them, how dare you? How dare you go behind our backs? How dare you go to him privately? How dare you think yourself as something greater than me? Something greater than the rest of us. And you can imagine sort of the individual disciples, Matthew or Peter or Andrew, saying to James and John, well, if anyone is deserving of a top job, why should it be you? If anyone is deserving of a, shop, of a top job, then surely it should be me. How dare you think of yourself as greater than me? This argument bubbles up between these 12 disciples. So, so Jesus is forced, I suppose, to intervene. And he calls them over and he stops them arguing and he tells them in this passage two vital things, two vital pieces of information. And so we're going to look at those two things this morning. The first was about them, about the disciples and how they should live and how they should behave. And the second was about Jesus and what he was going to do and what his plan and purposes were two things that Jesus says to his disciples in this passage both of great importance both vital both important to you and me and so we're gonna have a look at them in order for the next few moments this morning and so number one then the instruction that Jesus gives to his disciples an instruction for these 12 individuals on how they should live and on how they should behave. But an instruction not just for followers of Jesus 2,000 years ago, but that, that is just as relevant for followers of Jesus today, for you and me, as we seek to live for him, as we seek to, to follow him, then we can take this personally for us this morning, that Jesus is instructing those who would follow him, whether that's 2,000 years ago, or whether that's you and now, today. Look, says Jesus, to his disciples and, and to you and me. You are behaving, he says, like the Gentiles. You are behaving as if my kingdom was exactly the same as any other empire. You, you are behaving as if my kingdom, which is a heavenly kingdom, was just a, like another earthly kingdom or an earthly empire where the people at the very top lord it over everyone else. So the people with power, the people with influence, the people with authority are right at the very top and they use that authority to lord it over everyone else. You've got it wrong, says Jesus. You've got it the wrong way round. My kingdom isn't an earthly kingdom. 
It's not the same as anything else you've ever seen before. My kingdom isn't going to be anything like that. It's going to be different. And here is one of the ways, says Jesus, whoever wants to be great in my kingdom will be the servant of all. Whoever desires to be first in my kingdom shall be a slave to all. You know, and that's very different thinking. It's a very different way of looking at the world. It's a radical way of thinking, even for a society 2,000 years ago in Israel, that was based or, or where a, a servant or a slave was regarded as someone of the lowest estate, the lowest power, the lowest influence, the lowest position. Now, that's what Israel would have um, understood from the term servant or slave, the lowest of the low, someone without rights, someone without influence, someone without power, certainly not someone who was great, someone with virtually no rights or no privileges. No one, it, you, we can say from an assured at you this morning that no one but no one in Israel had ever desired to be a servant. No one had ever desired or aimed to be a slave. You know, it wasn't something that you aspired to. It wasn't something that you had an ambition to be. It wasn't something that you worked your way up towards. Now, to be a slave was the lowest of the low. It wasn't um, an indicator that your life had gone well and that you had worked hard and you'd, you'd done the right things. In fact, to be a servant or a slave, it was completely the opposite. It was a sign that something had gone very, very wrong in your life. It only happened to people who found themselves in the most unfortunate, desperate of circumstances. Now, to be a slave happened when you, you couldn't pay your bills or you couldn't honour your debts. You couldn't anymore stand on your own two feet when you had tried everything, but you couldn't make your own way in life. That things had got on top of you so much that you had so much debt that you had bills that you could not pay that you had tried everything else that you possibly could try. And as a last resort... When all other avenues were exhausted, you could become a servant. You could become a slave. It certainly wasn't anything to boast about. It wasn't something to be proud of. In fact, it was something to be ashamed of and something that you wouldn't broadcast and you wouldn't tell anyone. It certainly wasn't something to desire and long for and aim for to be a servant or a slave in the society that Jesus and his disciples are living in, and perhaps even in today's society. To be a, a servant is not the greatest of things. It's not something to, to boast about, not something to glory in, not something to aim for or devote my life to. But Jesus says, whoever wants to be great in my kingdom will be the servant of all. And so Jesus in this passage is raising up the the position of servant to a level of prominence and of greatness in his kingdom the man or woman he says who will put someone else's needs before their own who will attend someone else's desires or needs or wants as well as their own the man or woman who will go out of their way to be of help or of ministry or of comfort or a provision that says Jesus is true greatness in my kingdom and that's how greatness will be measured in my kingdom I saw it in other words the follower of Christ whether that's the disciples all those years ago or whether that's me and you as Christians this morning is called to serve and so that's not a call just for other people that's a call for you and it's a call for me this morning if I want to be great for him if I want to be great in his kingdom then I must serve those who are round about me I must serve the needs of others as well as myself you know we could ask ourselves the question uh, this morning well how can we be of service how can we be servants in the kingdom of God what can we do I thought this week very quickly of three things 
three ways which we can be of service in the kingdom of God. And perhaps we could just spend a few moments looking at them and sharing them uh, this morning. How can I serve as a Christian? How can I be of service in the kingdom of God to my community and to my family and to my nation and to my world? Well, perhaps one way to serve is to serve in prayer. And to come before my God, who I know to be great and wonderful and loving and compassionate and there for me, to come before my God through who I, I, I have access through Jesus, my Saviour, to come before my God and pray for the needs that I see around me. To pray not just for me and my wants and my desires, but to pray for the world around me to pray for my family and to pray for my community, to pray for my nation, and yes, even as wide as we can, to pray for the world that we are a part of. You know, in this crisis that we are going through, not just as a, a nation, but as a world this morning, you know, it, it has given us that impetus, I suppose, and that encouragement to go before God and bring the needs of a whole world before him, to think about the suffering, not just of me or, or of my locality, but of the whole world, and come before a, gro a God on behalf of the needs of so many other people. You know, we, we have such a privilege this morning as Christians. If you know Jesus, if you know Jesus as your Saviour and God as your Father, you are in such a privileged position to be able to come before him in prayer, to pray to a God who you and I know this morning through his word, is able to do whatever we would ask of him, able to do far more than we could ever hope or dream or wish or imagine. The Apostle Paul in the epistle to the Philippians says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God. Charles Spurgeon, that great Christian preacher of the 19th century talked about prayer on many occasions and this is one of the things that he said on the subject of prayer. No one can do me a truer kindness in this world than to pray for me. And so we can be of service. We can be of service to those who are close to us, in our families, in our communities and even those who are so far away from us in our world through coming before God in prayer to pray for the needs of others. So we can serve in prayer. We can also serve this morning in our energy uh, and in our might and in our strength through the works that we do, the good works that we do for others. We, we can serve through the works of our strength and our ability and our energy. You know, as Christians, it's, um, it's awkward and it, it frightens us a little bit to talk about good works because we are conscious that good works will never earn us into the good books of God, will never earn us towards forgiveness or earn us salvation or earn us a place or a position in the kingdom of God. We cannot impress God with our good works, but we can be of help and be of service to those who are around and about us. And the word of God exhorts us, encourages us time and time again to work for the needs of those around us. Jesus talks about the simplest of things in the New Testament, of giving water to the thirsty and food to the hungry, clothing the naked, visiting the lonely. He talks about that. Paul, in the epistle to the Ephesians, says that we have been created in Christ for good works. And in, in Titus, he encourages the Christian like you and me to be zealous in good works in our service for God. You know what? And Christians throughout the ages, have taken Jesus at his word, have taken God at his word in his, his Bible, and have served and been of great service to the world that they are a part of. They've served others and shown the goodness and the love and the grace and compassion of God through their good works for one another. The early church in the book of Acts, we are told that they looked after and cared for the weak and the vulnerable, and the widows who had such a, a lowly state in, in that kind of society, the early Christians made sure that they were taken care of and were provided for. If we go throughout history, William Wilberforce, the um, man who championed the abolition of slavery in, in this country, was a Christian. 
responding to the call of Jesus, responding to the word of God through his good works in his world. The founder of the children's charity, Bernardo's, he was a Christian, responded to the call of Jesus, responded to the call of God through his word to work for the needs of others. The founder of the Samaritans charity was a Christian who was responding to the call of Jesus and the encouragement and the exhortation of God in his word to be working for the needs of others. Men and women all throughout history who have shown their love for Jesus and, and their um, compassion for the world through the works and through the efforts that they have made. And Jesus here in this passage encourages his disciples and encourages you and me to be exactly the same, to be of service in our works. Perhaps lastly, we can be of service through our witness. Now as Christians, we have a wonderful message, a wonderful message that we can give the world. What greater witness or what greater service can I be than to tell someone about Jesus? What greater service can I be to the world around me than to introduce them to a God who is so great and so wonderful? As Christians, we have such a message burning within our hearts and within our lives. It's a great message a message of good news, a message of hope and of love and of promised comfort, a message of a future, of sins forgiven, of everlasting relationship with God our Father. What greater service can I be, or can we be, can the church be to anyone else other than to introduce them to a saviour who does all of that for them? And so these great instructions that Jesus gives in the first part of our passage uh, this morning to be a servant for all greatness in his kingdom is measured by that that we would put the needs of others on a level with our own great instructions about the need for service in the kingdom of god and in the kingdom of heaven yet this morning if we were to stop there if we were to put a full stop in our passage and if we were to just think about what we can do for God and what we can do for others, then we would be missing out on what I would consider the most important part of this conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples. You see, it's important for us to remember this morning that this journey to Jerusalem that Jesus, Jesus and his disciples are taking, this conversation that Jesus is having with his disciples is not really about them. It's not really about what they should or shouldn't be doing. That's just a sidetrack. It's almost something that Jesus has been forced to address because of the question of James and John and the argument that the 12 are having as a result of that question. Jesus is almost forced to intervene and talk to them for a little, for a few moments about service and how they should live in his kingdom but it's a sidetrack it's not what jesus is here for it's not what jesus is going to jerusalem for it's not what this conversation is really about and jesus is very quick or even desperate in this passage to bring the conversation away from what the disciples should be doing for each other and for their world and back to himself and back to what he has come to do and what he will do for them. You see, Jerusalem and this journey to Jerusalem at this Easter time isn't about me and isn't about what I can do for God or what I can do for others. Jerusalem is all about what God is about to do for me. Not what I'm about to do for him, but all about what he is about to do for me. And Jesus is quick to turn this conversation back to himself, away from service and back to himself. The last verse of our passage as we read it this morning says this, for even the son of man, and this is Jesus talking and he's talking about himself because he gives himself that title, the son of man. For even the son of man, he says, did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. 
Now that last part of, of that uh, statement that Jesus gives, to give his life as a ransom for many, what a statement that is. And it's worthy of a week all of its own. No, it's, it's too much of a statement for us to think about and to cover in these few remaining moments that we have this morning. So God willing, we'll be looking at that as the subject of our study next week. But before we finish this morning, I want us to understand this. It's not just about what I can do for God. It's not just about what I can do for you. It's not just about what we can do for each other or for the rest of the world. The most important part of this passage is about what God is doing for me. And it's important for us to understand that. Yes, service to each other is of vital importance. Service to the world is of vital importance. But don't miss the greatest of things about this passage is what God is doing for me. What God has come to do for you. What God has come to do for the world. You see, Jesus is in this passage, he, he's telling us, he hasn't come just to tell me how to live. No, as important as that is, that Christ hasn't come just to give me an example of how I should behave or how I should live, although he does that. And he does that wonderfully well. But this passage is a reminder to you and me that Jesus has come to serve. That he's come to serve me. And he's come to serve you. He's come as a servant himself. He's come to do something, not for himself, but for others. He's come to meet the needs of others. To meet my needs and your needs and the needs of of the whole world. He's come to lower himself. He is Jesus, the Son of God, King of kings and Lord of lords. Yet he tells us in this passage, he has come to lower himself to the lowest of positions, to a position of servanthood and even as a slave. He's come to be a servant to the world, a servant for me, to suffer for me, to die for me, to pay for my sins, to take upon himself the punishment that was mine. It's the most important part of this wonderful passage. And if I miss out on it, I'm missing out on the greatest of things that he has come to tell me. You see, this morning, I could be great at service. You know, we, we, I could think of, of Jesus encouraging me to be a servant of all and the slave of all. And I could think, Lord, I'm going to take you at your word this morning. And I'm going to put all my energy and all my strength into serving the needs of others. And I could put others before me in, in each and every aspect of my life. And I could be great at it. And I could be a Wilberforce of my day or a Bernardo of my day. But if I did that, I would still be in need of a saviour. And if I did that, I would still be a slave to sin. I would still be a slave to the chains of sin that so easily ensnare. If I did all that, it was the greatest servant that I could ever be. I would still be far away this morning from the love of God and the family of God and the future that he promises in his word. I still need someone to do something for me. I still need someone to be my servant and to do something on my behalf. And here in this wonderful passage, God himself offers to do just that. Jesus himself says to you and me, I'll be your servant. That's why I've come. I've come not to be served, but to be a servant myself. Now, what a wonder that is. And what a joy that is, that God himself has come to where we are, has lowered himself to the, the lowest position to become a servant for me and a servant for you, a servant for the whole of the world. What a sight that is this morning. My saviour on his way to Jerusalem to die for me, to die in my place, to serve me in my darkest hour of need. What a wonder and what a sight.
Now as we come to a close this morning, really hope that you are enjoying these uh, studies that we have, that we are doing together on a, a Sunday morning. It's a way perhaps of staying in touch a little bit at these strange times when we're not able to meet uh, physically together. I've also put them on um, on YouTube, so if you know of anyone who is struggling to access uh, the messages on, on Facebook, then you can tell them that if they go to YouTube and search for Bethel Bush, they should be able to access everything that we've, um, we've talked about up to now. So have a, a lovely week. God be with you and watch over you. For his name's sake. Amen.